Welcome to ASI. What a delight it is to be here and to see all of your wonderful smiling faces. Coming to this great meeting to be blessed, to be encouraged, to be strengthened in our spiritual walk. Thank you for coming, for your being here makes this planning and this session a success. May God truly bless you through these few days that we are together. We look forward to that day when we can be together in God's kingdom. May we pray. Father in heaven, we come to you this morning thanking you for the great gift of salvation through Jesus that you have given to us. May each one of us here present renew our relationship with you. May we be blessed and encouraged and strengthened by the presence of your Holy Spirit. We pray, dear Lord, this, this, this morning that your presence will motivate us to move forward with great courage and strength to share the good news of Jesus' soon coming. We are also mindful of those, that, Lord, that are in the valley of decision, at our homes, in our churches, in our schools. May we be encouraged and emboldened to go home and to share and to help them make that decision to follow Jesus. Thank you this morning for another day of life, Lord. Bless us now, and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning, ASI family. Good morning. I hope you're having a blessed time here. I know there's a lot of wonderful things planned for you over this weekend, and there's so many great things that sometimes it's hard to choose what you want to actually go and see. I want to remind you um, that we have developed an ASI app, so I just want to demonstrate a little bit about what its function and features are so that you can uh, uh, have some of these things at your fingertips that will make your ASI experience a lot more um, uh, easier to choose. So here's the app here. You can download it for free at the uh, uh, App Store. It, it basically has all the convention information, um, anything about any of the speakers. You can actually drill down and see uh, detailed speaker information, what time. You can customize a schedule if you want. You can put a little alarm on there that will let you know if uh, a, a particular seminar is coming up so you don't miss it. Um, if you'd like to actually go to the speaker's website, at a click of a button, it'll take you straight to the website. Um, if you want to know about the different ministries that are represented here, uh, there is a, a page here that will allow you to look at the ministries, uh, look at the projects that they're either being funded or um, where their booth is in the actual uh, exhibit room. There's... Um, convention media from the last uh, few ASIs, so you can go through and you can see actually any of the presentations that have been offered for the past four years. And one of the neat features that I think uh, is this um, ability to see a live view of what happens inside this room. 3ABN has given us the live feed, and so wherever you are in this convention, if you can't make it in here, you can actually watch what's happening on your iPhone in this room. So it's pretty neat. Um, here's a, a map of the surrounding area, restaurants and various things that are, that are around. And if you have any questions or you want to communicate with us here at ASI, at a click of a button you can email us, you can contact us, and, uh, and we'll respond to that. So that's a, a, a tool that I hope will increase your experience here at ASI, and may you have a blessed weekend as I'm sure you will. Good morning, ASI. This is our Offering in Action segment. 
And once again, we are excited to hear from our previous year project recipients about the work that has been done and to hear highlights from others for this year's projects about what they plan to do. So for right now, we're actually going to hear from Daryl Thompson. He's from the Ellen G. White Estate, and he's going to give us a project report. Oh, excuse me, a project report on the digitization of Ellen G. White writings. So give us some context and tell us um, what was the current plan or the original plan. Well, the original plan was, as many of you had our Ellen G. White writing CD, and we had six different databases that we managed, and we wanted to unify that. So in 2007, we started working on bringing all the writings into one electronic database. And then in 2009, we said, why not expand that to including all the languages of Ellen White that had been translated into one database? So that was the dream, and that's where we're sort of heading to now. So up to last year, or give us a, a status update. Where are we on the translations and, and moving them uh, into the online um, environment? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, some of you may visit egwwritings.org, which is the website in which we have all the writings available. And there are 58 languages up there. At present, we have 500 books available in the 58 languages. In the past year, with ASI funding, we added another 35. The previous year, we added 105. Um, this year, we concentrated on adding languages that people requested. So we did some Slovak, Czech, and 58 um, books in Korean. And we started working on the Japanese books as well. And that is working on and eight books in, in Arabic. Those books are a lot harder to do because if any of you have ever looked at Arabic script, it's nothing like the Romanist characters that we have. And so that's what we've been working on. And we've got like, we know there's about 2,000 translator books out there. Um, we have access to nearly 800 of them. And so far we've done 500 of what we have. That's uh, quite a feat. So you, you must have a, a large staff to work on all of this? Uh, we have a decent sized staff. We have like 30 employees. Um, that are scattered all across the globe, mm -hmm. and they're working on various parts of the project, yes. Now, this seems to be the year of the apps. I mean, we've heard about 3ABN's app, we've heard about um, maybe the sermons that could be considered the, the, in the app store with Audioverse, um, just a whole lot of those things. We understand E.G. White has an app. And uh, so tell us a little bit about that, and then how you're working on moving the, the digitization Mm -hmm. um, onto the app okay. for that availability. Uh, who here actually knows about EGW Writings app and uses it? Uh, good to see all those hands, yes. So we have an Android app, EGW Writings, and that's available in 11 languages. And then we have the iOS app, and that's available also in 11 languages. Some of you may have heard about iOS 7, which is going to be a big change. We are working on a new app and a new interface for that. I don't know if it will coincide with its release but we're working towards that. Okay, and I have to stop. You said an iOS, and that's not a language that I'm familiar with. Can you explain okay. that a little bit? Apple, you know. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> yes. <Okay. laughs> sorry. So if you have an iPhone or an iPad, um, there's the new version going to be coming out. And we're working on a total new interface to um, integrate in with iOS 7. Now, some of you... Um, may like, to, I don't know those Android users out here, but that is growing markedly and rapidly. And a feature that we've had for the last 18 months on Android, we're going to be bringing to iOS. And that is the ability to be able to play audio books directly through the app. It's been one of our most popular features on Android. So if you're in a book, you can just hit the play button and you can start listening to the book. We have about 50 books that have been um, recorded. Those that are not, we use TTS, which is text-to-speech. So if you have a Kindle reader, some of you might have heard of the, you know, being able to tap and listen to the book instead of having to read it. A lot of people have loved it, especially the young people, because they can be driving in drive time to work, and they can just press play, and they can be listening to Desire of Ages or Steps to Christ or Evangelism or any book that they'd like to as they're driving to work. So you don't have any downtime. You know, you can be listening to Ellen White all the time. 
And uh, so that's been really popular, and that will come to iOS. The other big feature that a lot of people like is who uses the study center in their app? It will make st Bible studies out of it. But it's locked onto that device. So we're going to be looking at putting the app in the cloud. So you'll be able to, all your notes, your bookmarks, and your highlights, you'll be able to move from I, you know, your iPad to your iPhone or to your computer and take the study centers with you. And best of all, if you create a study center, you will be able to share that with other people as well. So that's something that we're working on in the next 12 okay. months and hope to bring out. Great things on the horizon. So tell us, um, why do this? Why all of the effort and the expense to have LNG White writings available in that way? I, I think if we asked anyone here, they could answer that question as well. I mean, this church has been especially blessed by the writings of Ellen White. You just have to look at the comments that come in, if any of you ever looked in the comments section, or the emails that come in, and thank us so much. You know, back in 1991, I bought my first Ellen White CD for $500. Now, we give it to you for free. When I came to the White Estate in, in 2002, that was my mission, to make it free, to get partners like ASI, people like you, to contribute to the project so that we can make it to the world for free. Because the words that are contained in there cannot be replaced. Mm -hmm. As I read it daily, it gives me the spiritual insight mm -hmm. that I need to be able to get through that day, mm -hmm. just like reading the Bible. And the spirit of prophecy goes hand in hand with the Bible that will lead us in one direction to his kingdom. Daryl, thank you very much and for allowing us to be partners with you in ministry. Thank you. Thank you. Coming to the podium now is Rene Metz. He is the director for Maranatha OS. And I'm going to ask, Renee, tell us uh, exactly what you do uh, with Maranatha OS. That's a little bit different than Maranatha as we understand it here. Absolutely. It is uh, different. Maranatha is not the Maranatha International, but it's just a coincidence in names. However, I believe the purpose is the same. So we are a supporting organization in, for the church in the Czech Republic, for Czechoslovakian Union. And our focus is to bring people to Jesus, so evangelism is our main focus. And as such, then the Youth for Jesus program, which is a project for this year, um, falls under your banner, your responsibility. Absolutely, absolutely. Youth for Jesus is one of our main projects. Tell us a little bit about Youth for Jesus in the Czech Republic. As all of you are familiar with Youth for Jesus program, I don't believe I have to go into details, but uh, I would like to extend a thank you to ASI uh, because in Tampa, we brought a group of young people to get excited, get motivated, and get ready to start the project in the Czech Republic. And since 2009, every summer we've had a group of young people working in the project Youth for Jesus. And our main goal in this project is that uh, we are trying to teach and motivate the church that this is not just a summer project, but it is year-round project. It is not ASI's or Maranatha's project, but it is their own project. So we teach them and motivate them to take it as their own. So when the young people leave and go home, the church, uh, the church members stay motivated and they start, stay in action. Share with us a few of the specific challenges, some of the things that are different in the Czech Republic environment than here that you're faced with. As, as we all know, uh, as we all know uh, some of the challenges are similar, but uh, Europe is very secular uh, continent. Czech Republic is one of the most secular countries of the world. So one of the big challenges is when the young people come to the door, and especially the new ones who have no experience, it is very hard for them when they knock at the door and they get this very cold and tough response. So it is our job to motivate them, to explain to them, and to prayerfully get over this challenge. Also, uh, in big cities, Intellectual mindset is a big challenge in, in, in Czech Republic because for intellectual people many times the simple salvation is way too simple. It must be much more complicated. So uh, in the Bible studies, it's kind of difficult to, to discuss with them. But by God's grace, uh, he is speaking to those people as well. And maybe the last one, which could be similar across the world, is this uh, self-prejudice thinking. When you come to the door, and you already think that you will be rejected. And that's something we all have to pray 
for that we come to the door with expectation of blessing. Yes, yes, that's wonderful. Um, tell us um, a few testimonies, or what are some of the activities that uh, you may do? And I think we may have a couple of pictures that will guide us through that. Absolutely. We do have a few pictures. So if, uh, if we see them on the screen, this is a group of young people that actually is meeting this year in Slovakia in the city called Banska Bystrica. Uh, the young people on the next picture we'll see go, are going to the, uh, to the squares. They talk to people, they invite them to health programs and uh, to the me evening meetings as well. And uh, on the next picture we have something that is exciting. Wherever we go, we like to see young people being involved. And uh, you see four young ladies. Three of them are sisters. One of them is named, her name is Christina. She came to the Youth for Jesus program when she was 14 years old. And that year she was also preaching the message. And that was in 2010. And this year she brought with her two sisters as well. So it is exciting to see that uh, when somebody gets on fire, We'll talk to someone else and bring the young people with them. So we are very happy for that. And just uh, uh, as a side note, this is really significant because the young people um, are very kind of liberal in their thinking, and so it's difficult for them to kind of get attached to spiritual things. So to have them involved in Youth for Jesus is pretty remarkable. Absolutely. Um, for, for instance, I spoke with my colleague, Yurai, who is running this project, and uh, he told us that we've had few students who came for one week, and they said, well, after one week, I'm done, I'm going home. They went home, and in two days, they were right back, decided that they want to stay for the remaining of the program. And you are right, Debbie, uh, in the big cities, and that might be true for, uh, for the whole world as well, in the big cities, we are struggling with the liberal mindset, where young people are not much interested in, 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 uh, in spiritual things. And I'm thankful that the Project Youth for Jesus is really uh, working on the minds of young people. Tell us about the next picture. There's a young lady there. This young lady, her name is Adela. Uh, she actually happened, and we don't believe in accidents, do we? But she actually happened to be at Youth for Jesus program without even wanting to be there. So she ended up there, and she went through the course of the program. She got excited. The Holy, Spirit, the Holy Spirit touched her heart, and uh, she will be baptized this fall. So Youth for Jesus is really touching the hearts of young people, not only the people at the door, but people that are actually doing this, this service and this mission. And we are excited that this has this double blessing. It's a blessing to see people being baptized from outside, but it's a blessing to see our young people being converted, having a new and renewed experience with Jesus. And that brings us to our last picture, which really kind of culminates and gives us the reason why all of this is happening. Absolutely. Um, in our union, um, the youth in Prague is really struggling spiritually. And I've heard someone saying that, uh, someone said, I will give a big prize to someone who will inspire young people to live a spiritual life, to give them something spiritual. And on this picture you saw Luke who was baptized. He is a member of one of the Prague churches. And uh, my colleague, Uri, he started, after starting the Youth for Jesus Project, he started a Bible study group. Every Friday there are meetings studying the Bible. And this is really making a change in the young people's lives. And those people, actually 10 of them, are this year in Slovakia being part of the Youth for, Je Youth for Jesus program. And uh, this young man was baptized as a result of Youth for Jesus and following Bible studies. So we're pra we praise God for using this beautiful project to change the lives of young people. And Renee, thank you very much for letting us know how we can be partners with you in ministry. Thank, thank you. you. Our next project report from last year comes from the group NAPS, and I'll let them tell you what, this, uh, what NAPS stands for, and this is Darla. Good morning. NAPS is the National Association for the Prevention of Starvation. And I would like to hasten to say, um, not just the starvation physically, but the starvation, yes. prevention of starvation spiritually and in any other way, because they're looking at doing a number of different things for the community. So Darla, tell us a little bit about the project that was funded for last year. It was to build a wellness center in a particular location. Share with us a little bit about that. 
Well, right now, NAPS is embarking on the biggest project we have ever done. It's the Abundant Life Wellness Institute, and it's going to be located in Alabama, about an hour from Tuscaloosa. And right now, as we speak, the Wellness Center, it is totally, the, the land is there. It's been totally paid for 100%, amen? And then not only that, but the building for the Wellness Center is up. Um, it's the, the siding is done, and we have begun furnishing the building. The dormitory and the housing is up, and everything, there is no debt. It's been paid for because as we've needed the next step, God has always provided. Um, it's been great. <laughs> So tell us a little bit about um, this particular location. It's no accident that you're located where you are. And describe some of the need of this area. Yes, the area we're working in, I don't know how familiar you are with the Black Belt area, but there's an area in the southern U.S. called the Black Belt. And this area is noted for having the poorest, um, education system, medically deprived, highest rates in uh, mortality, dealing with multiple illnesses, diabetes, hypertension, people dying needlessly. One, um, there's been cases where we've been working with, um, we have a clinic that's running there right now every Friday, and it's given us a taste of the area. There was one day a, a patient came into the clinic, kind of staggering in, and as he entered, he went into cardiac arrest. The doctor, and the NAPS doctor, immediately came out and we started calling 911. We called once, twice, six times before anybody ever answered the phone. When they finally came, when they finally came, um, one of the things the lady asked on 911, is it an old man? And, um, and then she put us on hold while she finished the conversation. When they finally came, the EMTs didn't really understand what the doctor had done. They hadn't received training. And uh, in so situations like that, people have said that their, their mother was dead. They called 911. Their mother was dead for 45 minutes before an ambulance came. And these people are begging not just for medical relief, but spiritual. We believe that the medical message is just an avenue for bringing Jesus Christ and hastening his coming. Now, I know that even just the very presence, the visibility of the Wellness Center going up has attracted attention and interest from the community. Yes. Even since, since the Wellness Center started going up, people have been coming to the area. These ladies have been able to work with some of the people hand on. But even as we travel, some of you know we've been to your church or your camp meetings. As we're going to different churches of all denominations, the pastors are saying, take our youth. Whatever you do, however you do evangelism, teach them. And remember I said churches of all denominations. Take our youth, take our leaders in our church, and take them to the Wellness Institute. So already we have churches. Even though the center is not even finished right now, we're waiting on funds to furnish it. And even though as we wait for that, there's already a lineup of people who are waiting. And even from the clinic, they're saying, we need this. We don't want to be dying of diabetes. Show us how to remedy it. So this is not just a wellness center, but it's a training center as well. Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, you mentioned to me that the two young ladies standing uh, next to you that are uh, participants uh, in NAPS, um, that they work in the community, and the community just loves them. And I want to know when I talk to Chris, Kristen, why do people love you? Well, um, <laughs> the beautiful thing about that is it's truly the love of God. Um, there is nothing of ourselves that can attract anybody to us except for God's love. And um, as we work with the children, they see something's different in us that they can't see um, in their communities, in their houses. They see the love of God. And um, the most important part is we've had a privilege to be working in the schools there as well as in the Boys and Girls Club. We do many children evangelistic work. So basically we teach them about the principles of our faith and um, the children accept it and they accept it because they've received love. Mm -hmm. And um, if there's anything that I've truly learned about drawing a community to Christ is through love. 
So I praise God for that. Now you shared with me uh, an experience. You were one of the children that you're still in touch with, yes. a 12-year-old, or and and tell us a little bit about that. Yes. So right now, currently, I'm working with a 12-year-old um, that we met at the Akron Boys and Girls Club, um, where we did the children evangelistic meetings, and um, every night we call each other and we do devotion together, and. Um, the beautiful thing is the children are a median into the homes. Um, there was one night we were doing devotion together. We were um, studying Psalms 91. And um, I asked her, what is a fowler? And she couldn't explain it. She's like, I don't know, Kristen. What is that? And then in the background, as we're doing devotion, her mother says, girl, go get a dictionary. <laughs> and praise God, the mother was listening into each and every devotion we were having. And she too was accepting the principles that we were teaching and instilling in her daughter. So while working with the children, we're also getting into the home. Amen. Amen. Janice, you've had some remarkable experiences working in that area. Share with us a little bit about that. Well, I know that another reason that we've been able to receive so much love from the communities, we've been able to give love to them as well and really become a family. And the way that we've been able to do that is like by going to their schools, doing programs with the kids, going to their church services, um, even just visiting them at their homes when we meet them, seeing them every once in a while, we're showing them that we love them. And because of that, they've been, able, they've been more interested in what we're doing at the Wellness Center. You know, people have been coming by the Wellness Center, even though it's not finished, the staff houses that are finished have been having Bible studies every Friday night. And so people have been coming to the Bible studies, fellowshipping with us, and um, being more comfortable with the idea and bringing other friends and family with them as well. And so we know that the work is beginning even if it hasn't fully started yet. So we are lights among the people. We need to be immersed in the community so they see us as their friends and their family. So that as they see the love of Jesus, and look at these bright smiling faces. When they see that love, that they can't help but ask, what makes you this way? I tell you, Naps, keep doing what you're doing and thank you for letting us be partnership, in partnership with you in ministry. Thank you. Good morning. I am thrilled to be introducing our speaker this morning. Grace Daly knows what it means to win. She was the leading scorer in women's basketball at Tulane University, and in 2005 she was inducted into the Hall of Fame. Grace led the Italian Professional Basketball League in scoring and was named Most Valuable Player by the French League. She was also a EuroLeague All-Star selection in 2007. That's not so long ago. But Grace not only knows what it means to win, she also knows what it means to surrender. She grew up in a Christian home, but when she came face to face with Christ, her life changed forever. She entered a new game, a race, so to speak, a race to the finish. We'll hear Grace's story today, and I know you will be blessed. I can hardly wait to walk on shining streets of gold. I can hardly wait to watch eternity unfold. I can hardly wait to see a city made of light where there is no more crying, no more pain, and no more night. I can hardly wait to talk with Adam and with Eve. With Abraham and Isaac And with all those who believe Though my heart will thrill to see The glories of that land They all will pale to nothing In the shadow of the Lamb It will be Jesus Jesus, it will be Jesus. He spilled his precious blood. 
was a beautiful selection, and I'm praying that this morning it will be Jesus that's speaking through me to you all. I really appreciate um, the invitation to speak at ASI this year. I'm really grateful for the opportunity because every time I share my testimony, I am encouraged. I am re-motivated. I am energized. So I'm hoping that today all of us will leave here encouraged, re-motivated, and energized to be about our Father's business. Now, as you heard from the introduction, I had what most people would consider to be a dream job. So that means I got to live all over the world and all over the United States, and actually, all of my expenses were paid and I got paid. I had very short, I'm going to call them work hours, and I use that term very loosely, because I was out there playing, okay? So I had very short work hours. I was working for two to three hours a day, and I played on four different WNBA teams, Minnesota, New York, Houston, Phoenix. I also played for seven seasons overseas, three years in France, two years in Italy, one year in the Czech Republic, um, a season in Spain, and a few days in Russia and I'll explain that story in a minute. Well, here's the way that goes. Every time I traditionally chose a team, I chose a team based on how I could help them, right? What I could contribute to them. Now, one time in my life, and this was my Russian experience, I decided to choose a team based on purely selfish reasons, how much money I could make, all right? And at the time, playing in Russia for women's basketball, that was the place where you could make the most money. So I prayed, God, please, I just want to make as much money as possible. Send me to that place. And lo and behold, I ended up in Russia. And have you guys ever heard of the mafia before? It's real, okay? I had, I was called into an office to get, you know, paid upon arrival, and they wanted to pay me in a duffel bag. So I saw them putting cash in a duffel bag, and I had um, drivers, I didn't speak Russian, I had drivers that were watching me get paid in a duffel bag 
with a lot of cash who are supposed to take me to my apartment and nobody I knew knew where I was going. <laughs> okay, so it wasn't a very safe environment in my estimation. So that didn't last for long, it lasted for seven days. And what I learned from that story was, it is never a good idea to ask God for what you want, because you know what, you might get it. It's a great idea to ask God for what he wants for you, because then you'll get what you really need. So unfortunately, it took the Russian mafia to teach me that lesson. So anyway, my story is very simple. And before I get started, I just want to take a moment to pause for a word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you again for bringing me here and for this opportunity. I ask that everything I say today will be holy and fully representative of you. Amen. Okay, so yeah, my story really is simple. I decided to stop playing professional basketball so I could faithfully observe the Sabbath. And whenever I told people that, I got a multitude of adverse reactions. And the most popular was somewhere along these lines. You know you're a Christian. You know you're playing for the glory of God. Why would you stop doing that? God gave you a gift, and he expects you to use it to glorify him. And I kept hearing that. God gave me a gift, and he expects me to use it to glorify him. But the conclusion I came to was that God did give me a gift, but that gift was not basketball. The gift that God gave me was his word. And in his word is contained the commandments. And in his commandments is the Sabbath. So people often interpret what I did as giving up my career, but I'm very careful never to use that term because I did not give anything up for Christ. What I did was I gave in to Christ, right? I gave in to Christ and willingly surrendered and just to become completely obedient because he's the one that gave everything up for me. He's the one that made the ultimate sacrifice. My job was simple. Just give in and accept this free gift. And as much as people were telling me, hey, you're playing for the glory of God, what I realized was if I was truly playing for God, going about his business, then I would be playing by his rules and going along with his schedule. And I learned that the schedule was simple on my heavenly coach's team. It's right there in the Ten Commandments. I'm not making this up. Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11, right? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. And on the seventh day, your rest. So that meant I got to work for six days. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, during the day. And on Friday evening, my heavenly coach calls a, what is this? A timeout, all right? That is a universal symbol. Everywhere in the world I go, this symbol, everybody knows this means? Time out, right? So I'm going to describe a time out. And if you can imagine, this is exactly what the Sabbath should look like and feel like for us. During a time out, players go to the sideline, they take a break, and they give their coach their undivided, complete attention. They listen intently to what their coach has to say. And while your coach is talking, it's a great time to catch your breath, regain your focus, relax, regain your strength because you're preparing to go out and perfectly execute the plays that the coach drew up on the clipboard. So the Sabbath is God's weekly timeout for us. So along with the coach calling timeouts, on a team, the coach also is responsible for making the schedule. Now here's a typical WNBA schedule. I'm gonna hold this up, and it's actually okay if you're not able to read the teams on this schedule. What's important is that you know that every one of these lines represents a game. Okay, so this is a typical WNBA schedule. Now, on this next page here, I've taken the liberty of highlighting all of the games that entail practicing or playing on the Sabbath. Okay? So as you can see, the schedule drastically changes. All right? Now, it's not just uh, the WNBA. The same can be said for the NBA. And also for college sports. This was, I just printed out a current college schedule of my old university, Tulane University, and this represents the typical schedule. Now on this next page, you'll see I've taken the liberty to black out all the games that, pra that entail practicing or playing on the Sabbath, okay? The schedule drastically changes again. Now, here's one of my favorites, the NFL. 
Okay, I picked the Tampa Bay Buccaneers because they're close to home. Here goes a typical NFL schedule. Every one of these games, every one of these lines represents a game during the season. Okay? Now, here is what's left <laughs> after I black out all the games that entail practicing or playing on the Sabbath. And, you know, most professional sports are the same. I had a really unique opportunity to share my testimony in Trinidad a few weeks ago. And when I was there, I held up a cricket schedule because everywhere you go in the world, it's the same thing. If you're going to be a part of these teams, then you're going to have to practice or play on the Sabbath. So when I was playing for the Minnesota Lynx and I was on their schedule, was I about my father's business or was I about their business? Their business. When I was playing for the New York Liberty, was I about my father's business or was I about their business? Their business. When I was playing for the Italian League, was I about my father's business or was I about their business? Their business. When I was playing for the Russian League, was I about my father's business or their business? Well, you guys need to be better listeners. I was about the mafia's business. And that's why I left. All right, so when I decided to become fully obedient to Christ and started playing by his schedule, that is the point when I decided that I was going to be about my father's business. And to me, being about my father's business is as simple as being obedient. And most of you were probably um, born and raised in the Adventist church, so you may be wondering how come it took me so long to come to this realization. So I'm going to take that time to tell you this story. The answer is simple. I didn't grow up in the Adventist church. My parents actually made the transition when I was in high school, so I attended church on the Sabbath with them. And the way I saw it, we just changed the day we went to church, right? Everything stayed the same. It wasn't a big deal to me. We just changed the day. We used to go on Sunday. Now we go to church on Saturday. Everything continued as it normally would, including my basketball career. And I used to attend Sunday churches. And if any of you ever out there have attended Sunday churches, for the most part, you're out of there by noon, right? So that was what I was accustomed to. When my parents joined the Adventist church, I was in for a big surprise. On Sabbaths, when 12 o'clock rolled around, they hadn't even collected the offering. And when I would look at the bulletin, the sermon was so far down the list. And you have to think, I was a teenager at that time, okay? We weren't getting out of church until 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So my memory of the Adventist church is being very tired and very hungry. And I'm sure that many of you can relate. I also remember that I made it all the way through high school on the front page of the sports paper all the time. I made it all the way through college, on television and in the papers. I made it all the way through the professional ranks. And no Adventist, no church member, no health and temperance leader, no pathfinder leader, no stewardship leader, no pastor, nobody ever asked me how it was possible that I could advance so far in my career and keep the Sabbath. The topic of the Sabbath actually never came up. Now, it may have come up behind the pulpit at some point, but I just explained to you guys, I was a teenager and I was tired and I was hungry. I never heard it. But I know for sure it never came up in casual conversation with any church people. Now, everyone would just ask me about my games and they would tell me they read about me in the paper or they saw me on TV and they would encourage me. So naturally, I thought, these people are cheering me on. I must be doing a very good thing, right? Now, I'm not blaming anyone for my ignorance because that's exactly what it was. I just didn't understand the concept of the Sabbath. I'm giving you this information just to say that church people, we need to figure out when it's time to be a cheerleader and when it's time to be a prayer warrior. Being about our Father's business means being obedient. It means encouraging obedience and praying fervently when people are being disobedient. Anyway, no one ever asked me how it was possible to have my entire career while keeping the Sabbath until four years ago. And that simple question sparked an amazing transformation in my life. Here's the way the story goes. And before I tell the story, it's very important that I introduce two people. And these two people are main characters in the story. So I'm going to ask... Um, Dr. Don Bovell and his wife, Ann Burnett, to stand for a moment. 
and you guys get a good look at them, okay? Dr. Don Bovell, he's not the typical MD, okay? And we call MDs managers of diseases. So he's not the typical MD. He's currently trying to put himself out of business, and I'll tell you how. He's introducing his patients to God's healthcare plan of preventing and reversing lifestyle diseases. He's been practicing emergency medicine for over 24 years. He's an amazing physician, and he's also an outstanding preacher, and he's also the son of, the pre son of a preacher. Now, his wife, Ann Burnett, now I know they don't look much older than 20 years old, but they've been married for 20 years. Yes, I call her Princess Anne because she truly exemplifies what it means to be a child of the king. She is amazing. She's a medical mission coordinator, a licensed contractor, an outstanding volunteer in the community. She is an outstanding volunteer in the public school system, and she's a full-time PE coach volunteer at a local Adventist school. She's also an awesome cook, and I appreciate all those meals. <laughs> I could go on forever. But anyway, here's the way my story goes. I came home from playing basketball overseas and I was sick. I wasn't getting enough rest. I wasn't eating right. I wasn't being smart. And I'll go over that a little later. So when I would get home, my parents would say, oh, you know what? You can just go see Dr. Bovell and his wife. They will, you know, treat you. And <clears throat> you probably don't have to set an appointment. Just call them. So I said, okay, I don't know them but I'm not feeling well, so I called them. And lo and behold, they were just like my parents said. They were nice and they were loving. And uh, the first time I called, he allowed me to go to his office and worked me into the patient flow and I got treated like a VIP, okay? Now, this thing happened again the following year. I had not talked to them in between this interaction. I said, thank you very much for your help. Came back next year home again. I was sick, staying up late, not eating what I should be eating. And my mom and dad, they said, hey, Grace, go see Dr. Bellwell and his wife. They'll treat you. And I'm thinking, I just did that last year, and I haven't talked to them in between. I probably shouldn't do that again. But you know what? I wasn't feeling well. So I said, okay, I'll listen. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, okay? Because that simple act of obedience is what sparked this amazing transformation in my life. So I said, okay, I called up, and his wife answers the phone, and she's all bubbly and happy, and I don't know what this is. I don't know. It's, um, later on, I figured out. It wasn't craziness. It was actually the joy of the Lord, okay? So the two can sometimes be confused, but this lady was joyful, all right? So it was an attractive quality. Second time this happened, they called me over to their house and said, sure, just come over. He's about to go to work. Treated me like a VIP patient. I heard the missionaries say that the health message can lead people to Christ. This is exactly what happened in my case, all right? So this thing happened three times, right? And at this point, I'm thinking, this is getting outrageous. I keep not calling these people in between, and I keep only calling when I need help. So this seems like I'm using them. You guys picking up what I'm putting down? Okay, so I said I have to do something to save face. His wife keeps talking about going to the gym, so I will extend an invitation to join her at the gym. Now, one more time, Princess Anne, please stand up. All right, can you step toward the middle of the aisle? I'm putting her on the spot. I present to you Barbie, okay? <laughs> now, here is what was in my mind. I'm gonna spend time with Barbie in the gym. It's gonna be a total waste because I'm used to hardcore workouts and sweating and push-ups and every kind of thing that's, you know, just down in the trenches. And she looks like she's straight off the rack, all right? So I'm thinking, I'm gonna go, but I'm gonna be wasting my time, but at least it won't look like I'm using these people anymore. So we went to the gym and she invited me to her strength and conditioning class, all right? She had just gotten out of her dance class, so I figured this is gonna be a walk in the park. And you know what? I breezed through the class, and I thought, well, that wasn't that bad. That was okay. Okay. Here's the next scene. I wake up in the morning, right? You guys ever heard of something called DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness? <laughs> right. So I wake up the next morning, and I can't even walk, all right? <laughs> and I drive a stick shift, so I literally had to lift my leg to put it on the clutch. And then I started thinking to myself, I cannot be outdone by Barbie, 
all right? We're going back to the gym together. We're going to keep doing this until I can prove myself, okay? Because I, I play to win. I'm a competitor. So here's what happened. We start going to the gym, and after a while, she says, hey, you know what? Do you want to start studying the Sabbath school lesson together, right? And now the red flags are up because, remember, in church, I was very hungry and very tired. And the Sabbath school part of the service was a very big reason for that. That made me get to church earlier. So I said, you know what? I will study this lesson with this lady because I'm enjoying her company, right? I'm enjoying the relationship. Now, a lot of times we get caught up in religion and we forget about the importance of relationships. That's how you bring people to Christ. So the, partic- the lesson that we were doing at the time was called the Christian life. I don't know if you guys can remember this one. It's from 2009. And this is how the journey begins. We start going through this book, and in the, in the meantime, we're always going to the gym. That's our regular activity, right? Multiple times per week. The first lesson in the Sabbath school lesson was entitled Love. And I thought to myself, I know that God is love, and this is old news. This is exactly why I wasn't doing this book before, because there's nothing in there for me. God is love. I know that. And the next lesson was entitled Faith. And I thought to myself again, faith without works is dead. I know that too. My dad's been telling me about that. My mom preaching that, you know, my entire life. I grew up in a Christian home. So I'm going through the motions with this lesson. And the next lesson was entitled Hope. All right? And let me be honest with you. I was hoping that it would soon be over. Okay? (laughs) But at the same time, I'm having a great time at the gym. And I already told you guys, I wasn't going to be outdone or outlasted by Barbie, okay? The next lesson was entitled Life, right? And I know that the Bible says, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. So once again, I'm just going through the motions. None of this is really for me, but I'm enjoying the relationship with my new friend, so I'm going to continue. The next lesson was entitled Revelation. And it became one of those things again where... I'm hoping that God reveals to me when the end of this lesson book is going to happen because this is taking up a lot of my time in the mornings now, okay? So the next lesson was entitled Sin. I should have probably put this on the biggest size poster board available because sin is a very big problem we have on earth, right? So sin is a very big problem, and I know that the wages of sin is death and the gift of God is eternal life. So once again, that was no new news to me. Now, at this point, things changed. The next lesson is when my eyes started to become opened. And my name is Grace. And I feel like my mom and dad gave me the name Grace for such a time as this. Because whenever I see my name, you have my attention, right? Any document that has my name, I like to research the meaning. I like to read about it. I like to hear about it. The next lesson was entitled Grace, okay? And just a little side note, whenever you see the word grace in your Bible from now on, I know a lot of times we've been, you know, conditioned to think that grace is simply an undeserved gift from God. Interpret the word grace as God's power, okay? And that will change your relationship with God and the way you read the Bible. So grace is God's power. So God's power led me to open my eyes at this point. And simultaneously, as the lesson was called Grace, and I decided this is now about me, that's when Princess Anne asked me, hey, you know you're about to go overseas. How are you going to do all that and keep the Sabbath? And I got to thinking, because I had a contract already written. The dollar amount was already decided. I just had to show up at this point. I chose the country I wanted to go to, okay? She asked me this question, And I said, you know what? I can't. If I'm going to be about my father's business, I can't go back over there and play again, right? So the next lesson was entitled Rest. So now I have a direct message from the Lord. Grace, rest. And when I got that message, come on. (laughs) There was only one thing left to do. I picked up the phone immediately, I called my agent, and I said, 
game over. It's time for me to play for a new coach, right? And then he said, well, are you sure about this? And I said, absolutely. You don't have to call me anymore. If you have a job, give it to someone else because now I'm about to go about my father's business, right? So that was an open and shut. There was nothing left to decide. There was no agonizing over this decision. God just said, grace, rest. It was a simple choice to make. Now, what followed was very interesting. While Grace was here on earth resting, I started thinking, hmm, I used to be a basketball player while I'm here on earth. I used to do certain things a certain way. And the next lesson was entitled Heaven. So that was God just telling me, Grace, rest. Set your sights on heaven, okay? Stop thinking about what you were doing down here on earth. So then I thought to myself, okay, that's fine. I'll rest. I'll set my sights on heaven. But I used to be a basketball player. What do you want me to be now, God? Next lesson, <laughs> discipleship, okay? Before you call, he will answer, and while you're yet speaking, he will hear. So now I got this mandate from God. I'm going to be a full-time disciple. I'm pumped up. I'm excited about this. But then reality set in. I said, you know what? When I was a basketball player, I used to get a paycheck. I've been reading my Bible. And I hadn't heard anything about disciples getting a salary. Okay, so Jesus, how much do disciples get paid, right? And the next lesson was entitled. <laughs> that even makes me laugh, all right? Stewardship. And that was simply God telling me, you know what? You can keep thinking about your bills and you can keep thinking about your house and your car, but none of that's yours anyway. That is all mine. All you have to do is put your life into my hands and I will handle your business if you're going about my business, right? So then I thought to myself, where am I going to do this discipleship? Because I'm convinced this is my course of work for life now. And the answer came in the next lesson. <laughs> Community. Isn't this amazing? It's amazing the way God speaks when you're listening, right? <laughs> Community. So I decided I'm staying right here at home and I bought a house in my hometown and that worked out great. And I got my blinders on because when God tells me to do something, I go forward full force. So while my blinders were on about being home in the community, the next lesson was entitled <laughs> Mission. So that was God telling me, yes, you have work to do at home, but at the same time, remember the Great Commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And since I got that commission from God, I've been traveling every year on a mission trip with a group called United Hands. It's um, actually a group that was started in part by Dr. Bobel and his wife. We travel to a different um, country in the world every year just to spread the gospel through the health message. We provide free medical, dental, and optical care for communities in need. And at the end of every visit, they come to me, they come to the counseling station where we let them know that we want you to be in good health. And we give them the tools in order to stay healthy, to prevent, prevent or reverse whatever conditions they have. And most importantly, we tell them that God loves them. So we meet their needs, and then we tell them about Jesus. We follow his example. So what I realized is the more I got connected to Christ, the more connections I had in this life. When I started looking for a job, I couldn't find one. I had three, okay? And I turned down many other offers. And here's what I learned. I learned that the kingdom has to be our ultimate objective. And as I've traveled over the years, I have witnessed that we are losing sight of that. Now, I'm going to share a story with you that happened just a few months ago. So you know that it's not just the world that's losing sight of our objective. Okay? I'm going to talk about the Adventist church. I'm going to bring this close to home. And this story is going to illustrate why it is time to be about our father's business. Now, the Be Smart team, Dr. Bovell, his wife, and myself, we traveled to a church in another state, and just like today, I was asked to share my testimony. You know, I walked away from professional basketball to observe the Sabbath. It's a simple, consistent story. But there was a catch on this particular invitation. The pastor of that church told me not to make the Sabbath a central issue or a focal point while sharing my testimony. Now, let me repeat this so it's clear to you, okay? I was told not to focus on the Sabbath, try not to mention the Sabbath at a Seventh-day Adventist church. In the words of the pastor, the Sabbath 
is a very sensitive issue, and the church is divided about it. Now, I didn't completely understand it at the time why I was getting this message, but it was revealed to me later that some of the leaders in the church and deep-pocketed people have their kids playing all kinds of sports on the Sabbath, okay? So I was reminded a number of times before our arrival and upon our arrival to stay away from the topic of the Sabbath by a Seventh-day Adventist pastor and also by the associate pastor. Now, I never thought, I'm not that old, I never thought I would live to see the day when I would hear that the Seventh-day Adventist church is divided about the Sabbath. Anyway, I just prayed the prayer in Acts 4.29. I said, now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness we may speak thy word. And I went about my father's business. Now, this particular church had two services, and I thought to myself, well, I'll definitely make it past the first one. But then after that, the Be Smart team is going to go have worship back in the hotel, right? Well, God is good, okay? God is good, and I miraculously made it through both services. And needless to say, those that were offended by the message were those that were clearly in violation of the message. Now, I'm just going to say this to you straight, because I only know how to speak plainly. There are a lot of Seventh-day Adventists that are not keeping the Sabbath, it may sound harsh, but I'm going to speak as directly as I can to make sure this is clear. If we're not going about our father's business, we're going about the devil's business. There are no two ways about it. And we can't be about our father's business if we're not being obedient to our father. We can't work for him if we're not working with him. And if we're not being obedient, we're actually working against him. And you know, this thing is actually deeper than the Sabbath. We have to think to ourselves. How many Christian principles are we not sharing because we ourselves are not living them? Now think about it. The two main points of emphasis in the Seventh-day Adventist church that set us apart from other religions are the Sabbath and the health message. Do you guys agree? Absolutely. And I've already told you a very real story to let you know that the Sabbath is in danger. Now, if we take time to look at various congregations, we're also going to learn that the health message is in danger too. We tend to save the health message for Health and Temperance Day. And we do this twice a year, maybe, at the most. So this is a message that is clearly not being consistently reinforced from behind the pulpit. And in order to make real progress as a church, in order to truly be about our Father's business, this has to change. We have heard so many, because we travel all over the United States, okay? We have heard so many Adventist pastors use this line, and maybe you've heard it also. They say things like, eating right won't get you into heaven. Have you guys heard that? We've heard it. And although everyone will agree with that statement, you have to admit it's actually very disrespectful to the health message. And it's actually something that we hear far too often. Now, let me try to put it into perspective. You actually don't hear preachers getting up behind the pulpit and saying things like, um, returning tithes won't get you into heaven. Have you guys heard that? You've never heard that because they know that would be disrespectful to the tithing message and they value the tithing message. They respect tithing because they put it into practice and they've seen the miracles it can render. They talk about tithing every time the offering plate is passed around. They're convinced that tithing is not a means of salvation, but it is a powerful testimony of obedience to God. Now, you also don't hear pastors getting behind the pulpit and saying, community service won't get you into heaven. Have you guys heard that? It's simply because that would be disrespectful to community service. And they've put that into practice. They've seen the miracles that it can render. So they talk about community service all the time. They talk about visiting the sick and the shut-in, distributing li literature, visiting prisons, which we could do more of. And it's something they're convinced of. And they know it's not a method of salvation, but it is a powerful testimony and an effective tool in leading people to Christ. Now look, eating right and following the health message may not get you into heaven, but it will ensure that your time on earth as a disciple is more productive and enjoyable. It is a clear indicator to the world that you understand that true stewardship involves not just your time, your talents, and your treasure. 
not just using those things to glorify God, but also your temple. It is a method, is not a method of salvation, but it is a powerful testimony of obedience to God and a very effective tool in leading people into Christ. Now, many pastors, many leaders have not put the health message into practice, so they haven't seen the miracles it can render. And that's why they may not respect it or value it. When's the last time, you guys know the principle of uh, rest, right? When's the last time you've heard a preacher tell their congregation, you ought to go to bed early? It's probably because most preachers are staying up late, right? And the rule is simple. If you're not practicing this lifestyle, then you probably will not preach it, okay? So those two principles, the Sabbath and the health message, they are two gifts that God gave us that make it so easy to spread his message of love and salvation. And it is time, and it may be past time at this point, but it's absolutely time to be about our Father's business and to be obedient and start using those messages. We need to commit to 100% obedience in all aspects of our lives. And understand that there are no levels of obedience. You're either about your Father's business or you're not. People tend to, you know, people who actually are not about their Father's business, they tend to make excuses to try to justify their behavior. People that are about their father's business simply trust and obey regardless of the consequences. Now, I had a guy come up to me after I shared my testimony once, and he told me that his son was a collegiate baseball player and that it would be harder for him to make the decision to keep the Sabbath than it was for me because his son is a 20-year-old guy, and, you know, it's different for him, and I just don't understand. I'm here to say, and this is what I told him, there are no levels of obedience. We are all ultimately faced with the same decision. Are we going to be about our Father's business or not? Now, besides, following Christ is never a matter of giving things up. It's simply a matter of giving in. Once you give in to Christ, what's going to happen is you're going to willingly surrender all the things in your life to Him. And a life of complete surrender and obedience is the most powerful testimony. Now, I used to think that playing basketball was my vehicle to share Christ. But then I realized I was the one driving that vehicle. What I finally learned was that obedience is the most powerful vehicle because Jesus is the one behind the wheel. And I've actually had more opportunities to share Christ in the last four years since I stopped playing on the Sabbath than in my entire 15-year career. Now, fast forward to today. I look forward to the Sabbath. I love the Sabbath. It's the most awesome day of the week. But I also love the right arm of the gospel. I love the health message. You heard me talk about it a little while just now. I'm going to go a little farther. I love the health message. I don't just love to talk about it. I love living it, and I love the benefits. I also love sharing it. Now, the Be Smart team, myself, Dr. Bobell, and his wife, we have repackaged the health laws in a very creative way. What we've done is we've repackaged it in a way where we've made each health law a mission, a mission that you should accomplish by the end of the day. And when you accomplish that mission, you kind of check it off the list, right? So it's your daily accountability list. We call it a smart chart, and I'll show you how it works. But first, I'm going to go over the principles briefly. The B and B smart is for believe in God. Your mission, should you choose to accept, start your day with prayer. Spend quality time with God. Have morning devotion. Spend time in the Word and end your day with prayer. Something we teach children to do, but something we often neglect as we get older. The E and B smart is for eating fruits and vegetables and drinking water. Your mission, should you choose to accept, is to go for at least seven servings of fruits and vegetables every single day. And an easy way to remember that is go for seven to get ready for heaven, all right? Because as it was in the beginning, so it will be in the end. So we may as well start getting ready for heaven right now by eating the foods that God created. So E is for eating fruits and vegetables and drinking water. Water and no soda, all right? And we also are encouraging people to choose the fruit instead of the juice, right? Eat the fruit, the whole fruit, and nothing but the fruit, so help you God. 
And the S and B smart is for sunshine and ear. Your mission, should you choose to accept, is to get at least 15 minutes of sunshine and fresh air every single day. Now, if you're darker skinned, you need more time in the sunlight. 80% of African Americans are vitamin D deficient. 70% of Hispanic Americans are vitamin D deficient. 60% of white Americans are vitamin D deficient. The best source for vitamin D is the sunshine, and God has given this thing to us for free. We need to get out, get into the sunshine every single day. The M and B smart is for moderation. We teach the Christian definition of moderation, which means self-control in good things and avoiding bad things, right? Abstaining from all evil. So I'm not going to limit this to just tobacco and alcohol. I'm going to say we need to abstain from foods that are very high in sugar, like donuts and cookies and cakes and ice cream. So when we teach moderation, we don't teach children, oh, it's okay to have a little bit of ice cream after your uh, dinner. We teach children, replace that ice cream with some fruits or something that God created. And it's simple. We want to put things in our body that are good for us. When we know things are not good for us, because the studies have proven that sugar causes diabetes, contributes to heart disease, cancer, causes you to gain weight, suppresses your immune system, things like that we don't even want to touch, all right? We want to eat the foods that God made for us that heal our bodies and restore us. The A and B smart is for action, all right? A is for action for adults, 30 minutes a day, okay? For children, we're talking about actually 60 minutes a day minimum. Now, I want you guys to take one minute with me, okay? Everybody stand up, all right? We've been sitting long enough, and that's not healthy, sitting down for so long. And here's what we're going to do for 60 seconds. I want you guys to do this activity. It's very simple, all right? You're sitting in your chairs. All you're going to do is touch your bottom down to your chair and get back up. Touch your bottom down to your chair and get back up. Try not to use your arms. If you have to, that's fine. Ready, set, go. Keep going. 60 seconds. If you're at home and you're watching this, get up from your couch and just touch down and get up. And right now, we're looking great. This looks like a popcorn machine in full blast. So far, so good, but you're only 12 seconds into it. All right? We're going to keep doing this for 60 seconds. Come on, keep going. The doctor up here is working in double time. He's on a mission. We're 23 seconds into this right now. Keep going. We have to get to 60 seconds. That's our goal right now. We're trying to get fit for the kingdom, not just spiritually, but also physically. All right, you're halfway there. You have 25 more seconds to go. The popcorn machine is slowing down. It seems like it's almost time to eat the popcorn. All right, 20, 15 more seconds to go. Keep going. Some of you guys are getting a deep squat there. Your heart rate's getting up. You're feeling good. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. You may be seated. <laughs> I chose that activity to prove a simple point. Exercise makes you happy. All right? This is as joyful as this room has been as long as I've been up here. I should have did this at the beginning. <laughs> Exercise actually increases your body's level of serotonin, the body's natural happy hormone. So God gave us these things so we can be happy. He gave us these health laws. So exercise, 30 minutes a day. And exercise actually lowers your blood pressure more effectively than medication. But just like medication, you got to do it every day, okay? And obviously we advocate resting one day on the Sabbath. R is for rest. Rest, it means being in bed by 10 o'clock every single night, okay? And that's something we have to do if we want to be effective witnesses the next day that are awake, alert, and happy. Going to bed on time improves your mood. The T in Be Smart is for tell others. It's a very powerful principle that is a reflex if you're living this way. Tell others, share Jesus every day everywhere you go, all around the world, in your home, outside your home, share Jesus. And the T is also for TV time, limiting your TV time to one hour or less of quality television. And if you're watching this right now, this is quality television. <laughs> you know, when we explain Be Smart, 
we tell people to go for the goal. Don't just try to work on one thing. Work on everything. God's working on our entire being, okay? So work on everything and go for the goal. And what we've actually done is we've, this, we've come up with a creative way to package this program and present it to the public school system. Now, the B&B Smart is actually for Believe in God, but in order to get this program into public schools, the B&B Smart became Brush Your Teeth and Bathe. And you know what? We have parents thanking us every day about this because apparently these are things kids don't like to do. So their missions are to brush their teeth in the morning, brush their teeth before bedtime, and bathe before bedtime. So we devised something called a smart chart, okay? And I'm going to propose that if this simple chart, and actually the kids get it, it looks like this. It's in the form of um, a paper that they fill out every day at school. This simple paper, we have seen this paper revolutionize the lives of adults. It holds them accountable for their daily actions. We host free exercise classes for our local community four times a week, okay? And it also involves um, a game night for the young people where we incorporate a spiritual lesson at halftime. And we've been teaching these principles and we've had people filling out their smart charts, okay? We've seen people lose 30 pounds, 45 pounds, more sometimes. We've seen people reduce their medications, get off of their medications. We've seen people experiencing the abundant life that Jesus talks about based on simply following his health principles that he's given us for free. If we could get this paper, this smart chart into more schools, we have seen how powerful it is. It can revolutionize the health of America because it's something as simple as holding people accountable for their actions and letting them know that it is important to us that they do these things, right? We all need encouragement. We all need reinforcement. So we all want to encourage each other to be smart, be smart. It's time to start. It's good for your brain and good for your heart, all right? And if you want more information about our program, you can go on our website. It's www.besmart.com. 365.com, www.besmart365.com, and you can learn more about our program and how we're trying to get this into public schools and the health principles that we promote that are absolutely not from us, that are from God. Now, I'm going to close with a story that just is going to bring this whole thing into perspective and let us know that truly it is time to be about our Father's business. Because if we're doing anything here on earth that's selfishly motivated or is about us, we are working in vain. Now, here's the way the story goes. For the last four years, I've been a physical education teacher at the elementary school level. Now, in the upcoming year, I'll be a kindergarten teacher. And I'm excited about that. I love kids. And five-year-olds are the best thing that ever happened to planet Earth. God made them cute for a reason, right? Because when they start acting crazy, you can, oh, they're so cute, <laughs> all right? It softens your heart. So anyway, um, pray for me on that adventure. Well, every year in my um, PE classes, I used to teach a basketball unit, all right? So when the kids see me, you know, going between my legs and crossing over and making all the shots, well, the goals are only eight feet tall, right? <laughs> when they see me making all the shots and I ask them at the end of this unit, hey, do you guys know who the greatest basketball player that ever played the game was? These five-year-olds, they tell me that I am the greatest basketball player ever. <laughs> and you know, it's flattering, but I like to consider myself to be a pretty honest person, so I have to break the news to them. And I tell them, you know what? I appreciate you saying that, but it's not me. Guess again. And on one occasion, I had a kid raise his hand. Oh, I know, I know, I know, I know. Okay, who's the greatest basketball player ever? Michael Jackson. <laughs> So I thought to myself, really? Michael Jackson? So I said, listen, you're halfway there. You got the Michael part right. Michael Jordan. And these kids looked up to me and they said, who? All right. <laughs> Keep this in mind. A few years from now, if what you're not doing is about your father's business, no one will remember who you are. No one will remember what you've done. Five-year-olds growing up today, they don't know who Michael Jordan is. And he won, what, six championships? Leading scorer here, leading scorer there. And to be honest, 
if I had not been invited to appear here today, you wouldn't know who I was either, okay? So I'm saying this, and I told you that story to simply illustrate that it's time to be about our Father's business. Because if we choose to be obedient to Him, and I'm equating being about our Father's business to being obedient, okay? And if we choose to be obedient to God, we will be remembered by the one that matters the most. My Bible tells me in Hebrews 6.10, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you, as, as you, as you have helped his people and continue to help them. So everybody at ASI today, two things. Be smart, be smart. It's time to start, right? Second thing, it is time to be about our Father's business. Okay? All right. Dear Lord, thank you for the opportunity once again that you've given me to share my testimony. And just thank you for the, the motivation that I know that you have already given us. And I ask that you please just allow us to continue to encourage each other as we're on this journey, this journey to spread your message. Please help us to all remember and continue to utilize the tools that you've given us to make this so easy for us. Help us to be obedient to your word. Help us to always just strive to please you. All these things I ask in your name. Amen. Amen. Have you been blessed this morning? Yes. To close our program, I just want to remind everyone here that 
we're having the seminars that are starting very soon at 1045, and there are many tracks to choose from with very many dynamic speakers. So look at your programs, make your choices, and don't miss those wonderful seminars. Would you please kneel with me as we close? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we turn to you with praise in our hearts this morning, thanking you for your love and your mercy. Thank you for all you do for us all the time, Lord. We thank you for your precious promises, and thank you that you have promised that where two or three are gathered together, you will be in our midst. We thank you for being with us here at ASI. And Lord, we just ask that you will forgive us for our self-centeredness, for our lack of vision, our lack of faith and turn us, Lord, into the kind of people that you want us to become. Lord, we just ask that you will bless this convention with your Holy Spirit, with an outpouring of your Spirit, and that the vision for evangelism and mission would grow stronger and stronger in our hearts, and that, Lord, we might take this message to those around us, and that, Lord, on that day when you return, there would be a host of those whom you have used us to reach that will be there waiting with us to meet you. We pray, Lord, that you will bless our humble efforts because of the precious name of Jesus and because of Jesus' wonderful blood. We pray, amen.